Please join me in welcoming our presenter, Michael Stewart, a founding partner of Fishman Stewart PLLC. His practice includes domestic and foreign patent prosecution, e-commerce and information technology, patent opinions, intellectual property litigation, domestic and foreign trademark prosecution, trademark opinions, copyrights, trade secrets, rights of publicity, intellectual property evaluations, due diligence, and negotiating technology rights agreements. His litigation experience includes both trials and oral arguments before the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. In addition, Michael has substantial experience managing and administering large intellectual property portfolios. Michael? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. I'm going to be doing a presentation that is going to take a step back. Uh, I'm going to talk in the latter part of my presentation about what intellectual property is and the different forms of it, but I thought it might be helpful first to talk about why you might want to protect your organizational creativity using intellectual property assets in circumstances where it doesn't make any sense to do that. So let me start at the beginning. Apart from being an attorney, I'm also a business owner. I have my master's in engineering and I've been an attorney for about 30 years. Our law firm Fishman Stewart is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And Mike Fishman and I are the two owners of the law firm or the business that we have. We have 50 other attorneys and professionals in our organization and our practice is worldwide with a diverse patent base or excuse me, client base. So in addition to being an attorney, I am also a business owner. So as a business owner, I have some goals. One of my goals is to make money. And a short-term goal that I have is to maximize profit. But realistically, profit is only a slice of time of your organization. And even though you do want to maximize it, there may be other opportunities that you want to take advantage of for the long term. But let's start with profit first. In order to make money, I have to generate revenue. Part of the revenue that I generate is called direct revenue. In my case, by being a service provider, I'm giving a service or my organization is giving a service, but other organizations may sell a product. So you want to generate revenue from your products or your services. There's also the idea of indirect revenue, for example, licensing or franchising or those types of things, which can also make you money apart from your direct services or good production. On the other side of the profit uh, is the idea of costs. And ideally, what you'd like to do is reduce cost. And if you do it through enhanced uh, efficiency, that can increase your profit. There's also the concept of cost displacement. You have revenue potential that's lost when you accept one piece of business over another type of competing opportunity. And then finally, there's the concept of cost avoidance, taking action that avoids having to incur costs in the future. So here we are, profit, you wanna maximize revenue and you want to minimize your costs in order to have a slice of time from when you're making the most amount of money. But there's also a long-term goal. And the long-term goal often will have more say or more importance in an organization than just a slice of time represented by profit. One of the types of long-term goals who you may wanna have is competitive advantage. Is my product or service more valuable than that of my competitors? What about return on investment? If more money is invested in my enterprise, will an investor in my organization get a greater return on that investment than with respect to a different business opportunity? Finally, if you're a business owner or a senior officer in an organization and you wish to sell your business, are you going to be an appealing acquisition target as compared to other potential targets? So in order to look at the enterprise value, let's start with organizational creativity. And I suggest that really falls into two buckets. One bucket of organizational creativity is all of your know-how. It's everything associated with developing, producing, and delivering your products and services. And then the other part of the bucket of organizational creativity is your messaging. It's your content, it's your brand, it's your reputation. It's how people on the outside view your organization. And if you have a positive view or people have a positive view of your organization, then that gives you enhanced value. So in looking at the idea of maybe wanting to protect your organizational creativity, let's look at the concept of value. 
you know, organizations only have so much money that they can invest in new opportunities. And is it really worth spending your enterprise resources, both time and money, to identify and potentially secure enterprise creativity? In other words, is it really worth hiring someone such as me or my organization to help you protect that creativity? So some questions you may want to ask as you begin the process, is it going to help you increase your revenue? Is the creativity going to help you reduce your costs? Or is there some other long-term benefit apart from profit that makes your enterprise creativity worth identifying and securing? In other words, is there an enhanced enterprise valuation that real property cannot provide? And we're going to go into in a couple of minutes the difference between intangible and real property. And I think you'll find that discussion of some interest. So let's look at the concept in a graph form of how valuable valuable is. If we are just a commodity product or service producer, then anyone can enter our market or exit our market at any time, and we do not have a differentiator. The goal is to provide enhanced value so that you can value your goods and services more than at a commodity level. And if you have some organizational creativity that is very useful in that respect, then you can hopefully enhance the value. And what typically happens is that if you secure some organizational creativity using an appropriate asset, or in this case, an IP asset, it will increase over time as you leverage that creativity or that asset, but then it will start decreasing in value over time as other offerings in the marketplace become more valuable. And the question is, is it going to be your own creativity that's going to bring you back up, or is one of your competitors going to leapfrog yourself? But if you come up with some organizational creativity and it's not helping you increase the value of your products or services, it's really not worth protecting. So I have a key takeaway today in this first half of the presentation, and that is translating valuable creativity into an intellectual property asset may increase enterprise value if that creativity is worth protecting. So let's start talking about intellectual property. A lot of people don't realize that in many respects, intellectual property is a tangible asset. It is secured or it can be secured in the form of copyright, trademark, and patent registrations. And they are actually capital assets in the same way that real estate and equipment are. And they should be showing up in your balance sheets. And many forms of IP may be used to secure enterprise funding. Some of you may remember, for example, quite a while ago, Ford actually mortgaged its blue logo in order to get additional monies to help it survive turns. The Ford brand name is extremely powerful and very valuable, and that's an example of a capital asset. But intellectual property has something real property does not have. It has other value that is a little bit intangible. It can have value for including the ability to block competitors. You can dissuade potential market entrants, and you can clear a technological path for your technology to enhance your future market share. Moreover, intellectual property may be a critical component to branding to illustrate that your organization is both an innovator and a thought leader. So here we are in a pictorial type of a way. How can you leverage intellectual property value? You can do secure financing. You might be able to attract partners to work with you, licensing and franchising. And then another key area is selling disputes. If you get challenged with intellectual property infringement, for example, and you have a portfolio that has value, you might be able to go into a cross-licensing type of, an, uh, of a scenario where you don't pay any money, but you do some horse trading with a competitor or a third party. On the other hand, if you have the assets and you want to assert it against a competitor, that's a way of getting indirect revenue and also protecting your market share and the value of your organization. So let's look at the idea of IP value. It turns out in 1975, only about 17% of the total value of the S&P 500 was with respect to what I'll call intangible assets like intellectual property. By 2015, it had completely flip-flopped, and in the last year, IP assets represent 90% over $21 trillion of the total S&P 500 market value. 
It turns out that IP intensive industries in the United States account for over 38% of the total US GDP, and it accounts for more than 50% of merchandise exports. And in 2019, over a million trademark applications were filed, and then over close to 400,000 utility patents were granted in the United States alone. The reality is, though, is that smaller organizations are not doing what the S&P 500 organizations are doing in terms of trying to change their organizational creativity and create value when it's appropriate to do. And that may give you a business opportunity to exploit. So in order to convert your organizational creativity into a possible IP asset, there are some prerequisites that you really need to have. First, you have to be able to identify that organizational creativity. You have to have tangible evidence of its existence, a contract, a license, a patent, copyright, or trademark registration, or even a record within a financial statement. That asset must be capable of being legally enforced. And if you have an income stream, that income stream must be separately identifiable and isolated from those of your other business assets. It has to be capable of being sold independently of your other business assets, and it has to be subject to either termination or destruction at some point in the future. So let's look at some of the exemplary evaluation factors. We've already talked about identification, and you need to be able to secure or convert that organizational creativity into an actual IP asset that has value and can go towards your balance sheet. Then you look at the qualitative and quantitative characteristics of the creativity. Is it registered or a carefully protected trade secret, such as by way of a contract? What are your earnings, capacity, and profitability associated with that asset? What market share is going to be credited to the creativity? What legal rights, restrictions, competition, barriers to entry, and what risks are associated with that creativity? What is your life cycle and positioning? For example, in the, uh, in the airline industry, airplanes are around for decades, but if you have a piece of computer software, it may become obsolete in less than a year and a half. Finally, what are your historical growth and what are your future prospects with respect to that asset? So when we value intellectual property, there are really three different types of valuation approaches that we take into account, and often you use a combination of all three. First is the cost-based evaluation. It takes into consideration both how much it costs to create an asset historically and how much it would cost to recreate it given current market conditions. There's also market-based valuation. It looks at comparable market transactions, whether sale or purchase, of similar assets to help determine the value. And finally, and this is probably the most common, income-based valuation. It looks at an income stream attributable to the intellectual property based on historical earnings and expected future earnings. So what you want to do is take your organizational creativity, look at it carefully, do an analysis within your organization, and if you find it's giving you a competitive advantage in the marketplace, I suggest that you look at trying to convert it into intellectual property and then using that intellectual property to help with the funding of your business, creating value, uh, increasing your revenue, decreasing your costs, and hopefully giving yourself a competitive advantage so that the value of your organization and what it provides is greater than that of a commodity. So now let's go ahead and transition into what intellectual property is. First, when a new idea is first created, but before it's disclosed publicly, it's a trade secret. When the new idea is put to practical use, it can be the subject matter of a patent. When the new idea is fixed in tangible form, it is subject to a copyright. And when the product or service is sold, the source identification is a trademark. And so we'll go into each of these in order. So why should you care? We've already talked about the idea of properly securing and monetizing IP may maximize enterprise value. In the case of patents, you can get exclusivity for up to 20 years. Trade secrets, if they stay confidential, can be maintained uh, as such a thing as a trade secret for theoretically forever. Trademarks can propagate a brand and it can exist essentially forever. And copyrights grant an exclusive right to an original work. And while they don't last forever, they do last for decades. And so they can have value as well. 
So what I have in front of me, and I don't know if you can see me with this presentation, is I'm going to actually stop sharing for just a minute here. And I don't know if you can see me, but I'd like to show you, this is the Slinky. And believe it or not, as we'll go into a little bit uh, further, this was protected with a patent. Turns out the inventor of the Slinky was in the railroad industry and he came up with the idea of a spring being changed a little bit in order to create a toy that might have right appeal. So this is an example of something protected by a patent. Then we have the Slinky box itself. And we have a description on how you should use it and things like that. Oops, make it so you can see it. And we also have the Slinky name. And the Slinky name is, I would suggest, very popular and well-known. And even before they filed for getting patent protection for the Slinky, they probably did have trade secret protection as well. Because the fact is, is that how do you come up with the spring force, the biasing? How do you have it go downstairs in the way that it can when it's used as a toy? So those are additional things that are of interest. So let's go into what a patent is. A patent gives an inventor the right to exclusive use of its invention for a limited period of time, up to 20 years. What does a patent do? It allows the owner of the patent to prevent others from making, using, selling, or offering a sell or impairing devices that are covered by the patent. Significantly, it does not give the patent owner the right to make, use, or sell their invention. And a perfect example of that was the pencil with an eraser on it. One organization had the patent to the graphite pencil. Another organization had the idea of putting an eraser on it with a band of metal. And so the owner of the patent, patent, excuse me, the pencil patent couldn't put the eraser on it, but the eraser uh, patent owner could not put the graphite pencil with that eraser. So they had to cooperate with each other in order to make the overall invention. So there are three different types of patents. One is a utility patent, which is a new and useful process, machine, article of manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new or useful improvement thereof. Then we have design patents, which protect any original or ornamental design. And design patents are often a lot less expensive than utility patents. And uh, if you have something that's gonna be seen in the marketplace and it has a distinctive look to it, you might wanna try to get design protection for it. Finally, and I don't work in this area at all, we have plant patents and that's dealing with asexual plants. And if you have that situation, I can give you some information on a specialist, but that is the third type of patent. So what are the requirements in order to get a utility patent? Your invention must be novel, meaning that it's not been known or previously used by others. It must have a practical application. It can't be just a mathematical algorithm. It can't just be a mathematical equation. It has to, be do, has to do something in the real world that gives value and is something different from what's been done before. Moreover, even if it's novel, an invention must be non-obvious. It must be something that people wouldn't have just readily put together to come up with the technology that's associated with the invention. Finally, and this is a key warning, if you have come up with something, you do have a limited period of time before you can file. First of all, we are now what's called a first to file country, although we do have some grace periods of up to a year that other countries don't have. Moreover, if you actually go into production with your technology, you may give up all of your rights to be able to get patent protection at a later date. So be very careful. So one thing a lot of our clients do is they file something called a provisional patent application. It's never examined, but it's a placeholder, meaning that you give up to a year after the date of filing the provisional before you have to file your actual utility application. It can be informal, but garbage in, garbage out. The less detail you have in the application, the more likely it is that you're not gonna be able to protect the aha that's giving you a competitive advantage. And on top of it, you pay me more money if you do both a provisional application and a utility application 
and if you're able to, it's probably more cost effective to do the utility application and not a provisional, but if time is of the essence, a provisional application can be very valuable. So let's talk about patent scope. Patents are only good in a specific country. So they're territorial in scope and activity in one country for which you don't have patent protection is different than another country where you do have a patent. So a U.S. patent, for example, cannot be used in Canada or in Europe, and likewise, a Canadian patent cannot be asserted in the United States. We do give people a grace period, however, after they do their initial filing, and generally that uh, grace period is up to 12 months, so long as there hasn't been a public use or disclosure in which to file in other countries. And I've already talked about the fact that we're now a hybrid first-to-file system in the United States. Most of the world is just a first to file without any grace periods. So let's talk about prior art. Prior art is the existing body of technological information against which an invention is judged to determine if it is patentable as being a novel and non-obvious invention. It may include such things as publications, products, processes, and offers of sale. And we really do recommend doing prior art searches when appropriate, because if you're starting going back to that organizational creativity and to invest resources in a new product or service and someone else has already come up with it, it may not make sense to spend the money to do that. And you may want to go in a different direction. So by having us do what's known as a patentability search, we can show you by way of a smell test what might be out there. It can help inspire new creativity. And if someone's already done something that you're interested in doing, you don't want to be sued for patent infringement if it's still valid. So prior searches can be a good way to do some initial searching and to give you an idea of what you should and should not do if it's early enough in the process. Moreover, while we have very strong databases that are available to us, there are also some excellent databases available to the general public, including patents at Google, the USPTO.gov, the European Patent Office. And so it is possible for you to do some of your own searching before you uh, spend money with an attorney such as me. So what are the disclosure requirements for a patent? One is enablement. You have to give a sufficiently clear explanation of the invention so that a person of ordinary skill in the art can make and use the invention without undue experimentation. While this isn't quite as true anymore, it's still pretty important. You should disclose the best method known to the inventor of carrying out the claimed invention. And finally, there's always a duty of candor. You need to disclose the best art prior to which you're aware, and you cannot conceal either the best mode or enablement. And I also suggest from a business standpoint, you don't do that because if you get a useful patent, you want to make it so it's as difficult as possible for someone to challenge it later in court because you didn't disclose the art, you didn't have enablement, and you didn't disclose the best method of carrying out the invention. So we also recommend that you come up, and this helps you with your organizational creativity of having invention disclosure records. A lot of times, even in this day and age, we recommend that people have invention notebooks. So that way you can track the creativity. I recommend that someone review the creativity. And if you see something that may have enhanced value, you might decide we want to keep it as a trade secret. And we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Or you might decide, you know what, this may be worth investing in possibly getting a patent for it. But if you don't capture that creativity, you're not going to be able to make a good business decision on how to proceed. So patents are expensive. Okay, it requires a lot of work both by you and by us. And typically we tell our clients that over the period of three to four years, they should have planned on spending upwards of $20,000, in some cases, a lot more than $20,000 to prepare the application, to go through an examination process at the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and then hopefully get your patent. And you can stop the process at any time, but it's, that's the overall cost. But you're not incurring it all at once. I would say maybe you spend half of that money in the initial preparation and filing, and then the other half is going to come afterwards. Um, but I would have to say that's generally a base level. It can be more expensive than that. And I've already talked about provisional applications. They're a lot less complicated, but you're basically paying an attorney twice. So I wouldn't recommend doing it unless you have a business reason why you need to get something on file quickly. 
and I mentioned earlier also about design applications, they usually cost a lot less money to get protection for. The scope of protection is not as broad, but if you are able to protect the way that something looks, such as a tire tread, the way an oil filter uh, looks to the public and it's distinctive, it may be worth trying to get design patent protection as well. And this to reinforce, file early and file often if you're interested in protecting your organizational creativity with patents. And here's one from uh, Chevrolet. This was an advertisement. The Chevy Suburban, first made in 1936, never patented. Maybe we should have. So another thing that happens after you file an application is it goes through something called publication. And generally it's published 18 months after being filed. And that means that the public can read the patent file and under certain conditions can submit prior art for the examiner to consider. It is possible to do what's known as a non-publication request, but there's a risk to doing that as well. And finally, design applications are not published before issuance. I had mentioned earlier that patent uh, utility patents can be valid for up to 20 years. The United States is actually very, um, I think, more pro-inventor than a lot of countries are. You only have to pay maintenance fees at the fourth, eighth, and 12th years from an issuance. And most countries have an annual annuity. Now we do require that if you do maintain your patent in the United States, each of the maintenance fees is greater in amount than the prior one. Because if you wanna maintain your patent after 12 years, it must be having significant economic value. Otherwise you'd be spending your money and other types of creativity in order to create enhanced value. Design patents remain value, uh, valid for 15 years. And we also have the concept of what are known as continuation divisional and continuation applications that can be filed before your original application becomes a patent and you get the advantage of your original priority date. And that's a way to extend the patent prosecution process. This can be very valuable if you're worried about competitors in the marketplace looking at your patent, looking at what are known as claims, which set out the meets and bounds of the invention and trying to overcome those claims to design around your technology. And we'll come back to that in a minute as well. So I had talked a little bit earlier about the Slinky. So this is the Slinky patent. It actually even shows it going down and up an incline. It shows what I had done before in terms of moving your arm hands back and forth with the Slinky itself. And then it even showed it going up and down the steps. And this is a little bit of what the patent looks like. And so when you do a patent, you usually have what's known as the background of the invention that sets up what the problem is that you're solving. You have an obligation to, in order for enablement and best mode to discuss in detail how the invention works. And then finally, at the back of the document is something known as claims. And I had mentioned earlier that they set out the meets and bounds of your invention the same way that a deed does to a piece of property. Independent claims stand on their own. And we look at those claims in order to determine if someone is an infringer. And so the ability to write good claims and getting it through the patent office can be very valuable. Now I'd like to turn to trade secrets. Trade secrets is any information, data, and know-how that is not publicly available and is maintained as a secret and has economic value from being maintained as a secret. And of course, one of the most famous trade secrets, and it's also great branding and marketing, is the Coca-Cola formula. And in fact, I was in Atlanta several years ago and they had it in a safe and they're talking about the secret associated with it. But realistically, a lot of people really do like to drink their Coca-Cola or the competitor Pepsi-Cola. And so keeping that formula a secret does provide tremendous economic value. A trade secret can include any formula, pattern, compilation, program, device, technique, or process, anything under the sun that gives you a competitive advantage that you maintain in confidence. So trade secret basics, they can't be generally known. If it can be readily ascertained, then a patent may be a better idea, meaning that you know if you can reverse engineer it, then a trade secret's not gonna be very valuable. It has to, do, uh, to derive independent economic value from not being known. And that comes back to what we were talking about in terms of enterprise valuation. And it has to be subject to reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. And that's typically done with an agreement. 
So here are some exemplary trade secrets, and this comes back to the know-how that I talked about earlier dealing with uh, organizational creativity. This uh, know-how can include business, customer, and vendor data lists. You probably don't want your competitors to have that information. Pricing and discount information, manufacturing processes, marketing and business strategy, sales projections and target markets, software code unless it's publicly available, oops, I'm sorry for the typo there, and mobile health analytics. So how do you protect your trade secrets? First, lock it up, restrict access to the information. Two, limit access to the people who must have access to that information and use it. For example, coming back to the Coca-Cola formula, supposedly only two people in the world have access to that formula. Three, have an agreement so that the people who need to know the secret have a legal obligation to keep it quiet. And finally, mark any written material pertaining to the secret as being proprietary. So what are some of the advantages of trade secret protection? Unlimited duration, theoretically. Protection is theoretically, protect, uh, protection is theoretically available worldwide, not limited by any jurisdiction or boundary. No application is required, meaning you don't have to come to me in order to have the trade secret, although an attorney can be very helpful in terms of preparing the agreements that can help protect the secret. There are no registration costs, no public disclosure or registration with a governmental agency, and it's effective immediately. So I already kind of hinted at this. Let's talk about the difference between say, trade secrets versus patents. Trade secrets gives you protection so long as the innovation cannot be reverse engineered, is maintained as a secret, or has economic value. Patents are limited to up to 20 years with some minor exceptions, but they can cover innovations that are otherwise subject to reverse engineering or public disclosure. Moreover, in some cases, if you're not sure, you can file a patent application with a non-disclosure request, and then you can make a decision later whether you'd rather keep it as a trade secret or let it issue as a patent. But that process can be expensive, so I would look at it closely before you made that decision. So now let's turn to what a trademark is. A trademark is any word, name, symbol, or device, or anything combination thereof, which is used to identify and distinguish goods and services and indicate their source. And I've given on the slide some examples of how Coca-Cola is known, both by the shape of its bottle, and this is actually one of their newer metal cans, but it still has the distinctive shape. And then we have it as a word mark, we have it as a script, and then we have it as a script with some um, uh, artwork as well. All those are examples of Coca-Cola-based trademarks. So what are some of the trademark basics? Typically, it's used to protect brand names and logos, and it can be used for goods and services. And you can use the R in the circle once you have a federal registration, but you have to actually maintain that federal registration and the mark cannot become generic. And some examples of genericism may be, you know, or at least close to it, would be uh, the Q-tip, the idea of having a Xerox for photocopying. Thermos, we use the, the kind of insulated bottle for hot liquids and cold liquids actually did become generic. And there are other examples as well. So you do wanna maintain the distinctiveness and your mark needs to continue acting as a source identifier. And in the United States, if you have a federal registration, it comes with a 10 year term with 10 year renewals, but you also have to do a filing at the fifth year after your initial registration issues in the United States. So let's talk about the functions of a trademark. It functions as the source of origin of goods or services. It helps guarantee the quality of your offerings. And that's a way that you can protect yourself from counterfeits and competitors that have an inferior product or service. It can help maintain and create demand. It can be extremely valuable as a marketing tool to build a brand. And this goes to the organizational creativity with your messaging and it can have tremendous economic value to a company. Let's talk about Google. We actually use it as a verb now. I'm going to go Google that. That is just tremendous name recognition with a single brand. So how do you protect a trademark? They're protected under federal and state law. They're earned and not born, 
and they come into being through actual use. You don't have to have a federal registration. We do have the ability to get common law protection for trademarks, but it is advantageous to have a federal registration because it gives constructive notice to the public of your trademark rights, and you can use that registration and that mark for your goods or services anywhere in the country so long as there isn't already somebody else who is using it in a very dedicated geographic area. So here's an example of um, an entire advertisement that I saw several years ago for Valentine's Day. And if you look at this, this is a mark of a, of a very, very popular and strong brand that if you look you kind of in the middle and you look a bit to the right, you see the Mercedes symbol. And most people are gonna recognize that over all the other chocolate. And that's an example of a strong trademark. So I mentioned earlier about the importance of having an R in a circle. You use a TM for unregistered trademarks, you use SM for unregistered service marks, and the R in the circle is only used for registered tra trademarks. So finally, the remaining topic I did wanna to try to cover today is really talking about copyrights. And copyright is an original expression by an author that is fixed in a tangible medium. It relates to analytic data in graphs, the patient instructions, policy standards, sculptures, software code, user manuals, and things like that. Anything that can be fixed in a tangible medium. Copyrights are actually administered in the United States by the Library of Congress, not by the United States Patent and Trademarks Office. And that's just a, uh, an accident of history. But a copyright protects the original works of authorship, including literary, dramatical, musical, artistic, and even certain other types of intellectual works. And as I said, the term for a copyright is decades. It's very hard to calculate and it depends on specific circumstances, but it's gonna be around a long time. So with copyrights, excuse me, you can identify it in a work uh, using the copyright symbol and then the name of your organization. We recommend that, it's not required, but it should be affixed to all published works to avoid certain defenses to infringement, such as an innocent infringer. And the three elements, if you're gonna use the copyright logo are the copyright symbol, or it's one of these other examples I'm showing on the slide, the year the work was first published, and finally, the name of the copyright owner. Copyright registration is optional, but it provides a number of statutory advantages. There's a presumption of ownership, there's statutory damages, and you actually have to have a copyright registration before you can file suit against an alleged infringer. We recommend strongly that you register within three months of first publication to preserve all rights. If you're only gonna be doing copyrights every once in a while, you may wanna use an attorney. But if you are thinking that you have a lot of different types of things that you wanna get copyright protection for because you're concerned that other people are gonna plagiarize them, we can help educate you how to do your own copyright registration. It's not hard. And the Copyright Office at copyright.gov gives excellent resources and what they call circulars to help you decide how to, about, uh, to do your own copyright registration. Uh, filing and it's typically in the range for around 50 or $60. So if you're doing a one-off, it's probably more cost-effective to have an attorney do it. But if this is something you're thinking of doing on a regular basis to convert your organizational creativity into an IP asset that you can protect, you might wanna learn how to do it yourself. Patents, I really strongly recommend that you have an attorney involved with. And I would generally recommend that you have an attorney help you with the trademark area. But for copyrights, I think that's an area where uh, organizations that do this regularly probably can do the day-to-day -day work without an attorney. So sorry if I moved a little bit quickly, but uh, wanted to, and I put this actually in the chat, you can get a copy of the slide as well as a white paper dealing about the idea of valuing uh, your organizational creativity at uh, our website. And I did put that in the chat or you can go to my biography as well so that you can get um, um, a link to get to where today's presentation is. And I've also given you a white paper that gives you some background 
Another thing I'd like to recommend is that if you're interested in learning more about different forms of intellectual property and uh, how you might want to try to protect it, uh, you might want to do a takedown if you're involved with social media. Um, if you're interested in cannabis trade, we're actually finishing up a white paper on that. You can go to our Tackle Box Insights page to get more information. So what I'd like to do at this point is stop the sharing. And then if people would like to ask me any questions or if they have any concerns, uh, I'd like to try to address your questions if you have any. So is there anything anyone would like to ask? And if you wish, you can put it in the chat as well. Um, okay, hi, Jonathan. I did this at the beginning, but let me give it to you again here. I'll just put it back here. Oops. There you go. Um, any questions? Yeah, sorry about that, Jonathan. I'm glad you got it. Feel free to well, unmute yourself and ask a question of Michael. If you want to, you don't have to, but I'm glad to answer anything you might have. Okay, well, if you have any questions at all, you have my email address, and you have my phone number. Um, be glad to answer if you're, any of your uh, inquiries or to just have a discussion. We never do charge for an initial consultation that we have with people. Otherwise, I wish all of you the hopes I have someone, uh, something from Melody. Hi, Melody. And then I also see something from Tim. Uh, Tim, let me start with yours. Um, you file an assumed name in the state of Michigan and prevent anyone from using that name in the state. That is actually not completely accurate. It does mean that you have an assumed name certificate. Someone can't register their organization using the same name, but that's a little bit different than trademark protection. Also, think about the fact that you can have the same name in different industries and still get trademark protection. So it's both the mark and the goods and services with which it's associated. For example, we have Sterling for Sterling Bank, and I've also seen signs for a Sterling Optical. Those are both uses of Sterling, but we're not confused between a bank and an eyeglass company. So an assumed name certificate keeps other people from using the business name, but it's not the same thing as trademark protection. You can actually get a state trademark registration, and I would recommend maybe doing that if you're only getting or using a mark in a certain state, um, but it's not the same thing as having a federal registration. In order to get a federal registration, you actually have to use the mark in interstate commerce, that means between states or between like Michigan and Canada, but if you do get that federal registration, you can keep all newcomers anywhere in the country for using a confusingly similar mark for the same goods and services. So hopefully that answered your question, Tim. Uh, Melody, your question is, what is the best way for manufacturing teams to deal with visitors in their facilities when there's a process that is considered trade secret? That is a really good question. Um, first of all, I would try to limit access to letting people see the secret processes within your um, factory. But if they have to have access to it, we strongly recommend that before they come into the facility, they sign a short non-disclosure or confidentiality agreement and acknowledge that what they're seeing is confidential and that they cannot use that information in a way that competes with you. It's not perfect, but it's the best that can be done under a number of circumstances. Having said that, we've had situations where someone comes into the United States, sees a secret process, goes to a foreign country, practices that, and then basically thumbs their nose saying, go, go ahead and try to sue us in our home country. Good luck with that. So I would be careful while giving access to people, keep it secret as much as you can. And if you do need to give access, I would have when they sign the visitor log, also having to sign a confidentiality agreement uh, that can be pretty standard. And if you need, I'd be glad to give, maybe give you some assistance and some information on how to do that, Melody. Yep, um, formal method for team. Yep, the more you can automate this so that people don't have to feel awkward. Um, I'll tell you the person who is most valuable doing this is gonna be the receptionist. Um, those people can be very aggressive. Also, a number of our clients now are doing this in a digital form, and they won't even let you in the facility until you've signed this thing, either with paper or in a digital format. Any other questions? 
Thank you so much, Michael. And everyone, please feel free to unmute yourself and thank Michael as you exit the meeting. Thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a great day today and uh, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for the presentation. My pleasure. Thank you.